more animals. There's the theme. Yeah. For... <laughs> How, how terrific. Chris, I love the way you sort of, uh, clinical education can be such a competitive and transactional activity. And I really like the way you bring it back to shared values and sort of a spirit of principle negotiation, trying to understand the needs of the delivery system and how we create more value. I think that's a really terrific perspective. Why don't we take about 10 minutes uh, or so and um, post some uh, questions for Chris. I want to make sure she has a chance to respond and hear from the group. And then as we sort of wrap up the session, we'll sort of open the mics for everyone and uh, have a little bit of time for synthesis before we wrap up. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Susan Scoshalak from the American Medical Association. I really value your comments about students and faculty needing to understand the realities of the healthcare system. That gap's been growing, and we've been trying to work in physician education with saying that we're really missing a third pillar of content. We're great in teaching about basic or fundamental sciences and clinical sciences, but we're missing health system sciences. We're missing understanding about all those things that we think are important, social determinants, working in teams, understanding the healthcare system, patient safety, value-based care, and it's on us that our students are leaving our programs, not understanding the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, that's crazy, but we don't even talk about those things. So we, we've been encouraged with places that are willing to take this on as a whole new area of curriculum and dumping the old stuff that we can let go of, and then really also working on how the students can bring value to the healthcare system, and there are models out there for that. Not by payment, but by doing things that the system needs in reciprocity for taking on our students. So I'm so excited to hear your advocacy for this. You've captured it. The idea that um, if they're not really having a reality-based course about what they're gonna face when they come into these organizations that are under stress, and they are expecting the student to be aware of those things, and they're not, it really creates havoc within the clinical setting. If I could just follow up, because this builds on both on what Joanne and Aaron said. For example, Inga said we need to think about both the who and the where. And what we've been doing in the innovative programs is changing the faculty. So medical students are working with navigators and calling the, fa the navigators faculty because they are faculty and valuing the fact that if you want to learn about the healthcare system, don't learn about it from a physician preceptor. We don't know. We didn't learn that. But the navigators can tell you what's working and isn't working for a patient and their family. So, so those are the kinds of models that I hope we're all aspiring to. Thanks. Lemmy McNeely with the American Speech Language Hearing Association. I think we're all challenged with um, how do we bring into the educational systems those clinicians who are actively involved in care because they also don't have time to come and teach in the classes and how do we enhance the knowledge and skills that the faculty have who've not been in practice in a while. That's a real challenge and who's going to supervise who as we talk about interprofessional education and collaborative practice accrediting agencies and certifying bodies need to loosen the grip, if you will, and not require only a speech language pathologist being the person who's going to supervise a student who's enrolled in a program in speech language pathology. So one of the challenges is what happens first? Because there are changes that have to occur at every level, in the academic institutions, in the accrediting agencies, in the certifying bodies, in the regulatory agencies, in the licensure uh, bodies. How do we make all of these changes happen quickly enough? Because they need to happen now, right? We know that the change is here. There are other changes that are continuing to come, but there are changes that really need to happen now. And so I struggle with how do we have all of the changes happen? Um, what's the synergy for having that happen? And when? What's the nexus of that happening? Can I ask you a naive question? For all of you who have placements, how often and how many times do you ask those placement people to come in and do lectures? 
that varies from institution to institution, um, whether or not they are in a urban community or a rural community. So there isn't a single answer to that, unfortunately. There should be a minimum, right, that's required, I think would be one place to start. Right, and you're hopefully talking about technology. So people having to leave their facility isn't necessary anymore with Zoom classroom and a variety of different settings. That even bringing someone in that way into the classroom and being able to talk about the reality of providing services might be a benefit. And it might be naive of me to think that would be the case, but even as a, a former OT student, I would have loved to have had someone come in. We had lots of preclinical work, so I was blessed with that, but um, I think it would have been beneficial. I think the Area Health Education Consortia have done some interesting work there. The ECHO model is another sort of fascinating yes. construct to exploit. How about here? I'm Frank Gascioni from the University of Michigan, where I'm director of the Center for Professional Education. But before that, I was dean of pharmacy. And it was very interesting when you were talking about the placements, and Pam had talked about the issues confronting nursing. Pharmacy had dealt with that for a number of years. My question is, you talked about the overall survey, and I'm very aware of the variation that universities have or schools with their institutions, and it varies enormously in terms of relationship. We had a very successful model that we use in, in a sense. And the characteristics of it is number one, we um, partnered extensively with the preceptors at each of our sites. They were part of our clinical faculty, which meant we gave them continue, continuous continu uh, uh, professional development. We kept them included in our areas. We had a very clear expectation for them. We rewarded them. And they got the pleasure of educating our students. And they loved it. So that was one part of it. The second part of it was guaranteeing to them that our students were going to be on the best behavior and that we aligned with their expectations and so forth. And, and then the third part was demonstrating the ad value added. For example, our students were involved in medic medication reconciliation projects were well published that demonstrated the value to the system. So my question is, when you looked at the survey, were you able to glean out some of those best practices I think that when um, you look at the answers, one of the things that you're describing a model that didn't come through on this survey, that communication with the university, that engagement. Certainly when I think, when I, you were speaking, I'm thinking of our standards that we say our providers have to use evidence-based practice, clinical guidelines, professional consensus, and if they can interact with a university that is working on those items and they're giving them continuing education and there's an opportunity they can take that back to their university, that's a great value, uh, their facility, that would be a great value add. What was clear is there's no value add. That unless they're recruiting these students to work in their organization, then the value add isn't evident anymore because the demands of productivity and the demands on um, having shortages in areas are creating havoc within being able to meet everything that all the different parties are requiring. And so I think if your model was duplicated, there would be more people who would see value because it would help them meet accreditation standards for their organization, but it also brings benefit to their entire organization because if they're, they have that opportunity to get current research, statistics that they can use, that's a win-win. And I think throughout the survey it was that there wasn't a win-win kind of um, feel to the answers. Let me offer one comment and then we'll take a couple more questions. I, I worked as a, a healthcare executive at an academic medical center in North Carolina and a comment that you made sort of resonated. Um, and during the, that time, I worked on workforce optimization. So we recruited for a number of professionals, um, medicine and nursing and pharmacy and PA and a lot of others. And we had a system to identify based on the training program how many months it would take for the health system to prepare, orient, or remediate that uh, sort of workplace training activity until they were sort of practice ready. And it was the pivot that allowed us to determine which schools we wanted to work with. If it, if we could prepare a professional in three months from this institution, but it took nine in the other, it was, a, it was an economic equation. And I think just as I sort of reflect on it now, those schools that were most engaged and curious and spending time in the health system to try to understand what the concerns were, what the technology issues, what the, the movement, I mean, th those really, I think, were the ones that best performed. So maybe there's a hint in there about how we try to put our scientific curiosity towards how the health systems and 
employers are sort of performing. We got a lot in here. Thank you. Lonette Wolford from the National League for Nursing, but I'm also a nurse executive in the practice setting. And so um, what, what I want to say is that I think as health professions educators, there's probably two things that uh, we can own and champion further. It really became clear, you know, as you presented this fabulous presentation this morning. Um, one is curricular change, right? So, uh, you know, the emphasis in curricula now uh, for nursing and probably across the health professions is really preparing students to work in those acute care settings. So it's not just, you know, and, and, and we are uh, held to standards, you know, NCLEX and other licensing and, and agencies that are keeping us in this arena of focusing on, uh, on yesterday's preparation. So we should probably own that a little bit more and figure out how we are going to influence, um, you know, those agencies that set those standards for us uh, to help them understand how care is shifting. And the second thing um, I think is that we probably could own and champion further this conversation in the practice arena because as you talk about, uh, you know, I think we're all on board here, right? But we, you know, in the practice arena, a lot of our practice leaders are still steeped in traditional pathways to getting to ambulatory or non-inpatient settings. Uh, I find every day when I try to push this agenda that um, I get resistance from practice leaders who feel that nurses, for example, need to work in a hospital first before they can go into a home or before they can go into ambulatory or before they, and so they resist this idea that we should start preparing them as students to go directly into these uh, non-acute care settings. So I, I think that we should probably be thinking about how we can collectively influence the practice leaders as well as the agencies that are holding us to certain standards that, that um, restrict our ability to prepare students the way we know we should. Um, Chris, I have a quick question for you, Barbara Brandt. Um, there was, you noted that there, some people responded that they're not capturing the value, that they're not able to hire the workforce. We're actually seeing that too. Uh, we work with a very large health system. 200 health professions programs rotate through their system, and they're very disappointed at the, at the capture for the workforce. So these systems truly are considering whether it's worth it. Yeah. And you might comment. <laughs> it's, it's a common theme. We have um, over... Uh, 1,400 peer review surveyors who do our surveys. And so they're people who um, want to improve services. And they work in accredited programs. And they definitely are always saying, you know, it's getting harder and harder for us to prove that we need these specialty types of students coming in through our program. And the hospital, the bigger hospital systems are saying, what's the value? And we get that as an accreditor constantly. We're constantly asked, well, why should we do this? Why should we be accredited? So you have to come up with your value point. So I guess I would challenge all of you who have these kinds of programs and universities, what is your value proposition for those that are taking your students? How do you present that to them so they are excited about taking your students and see it as a win-win? That's an, a critical factor. Let's let's start here, and then we'll go here, and let's let's open up to all three in the time that we have left, and uh, try to benefit for all this brain power, at least this part of the table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Mary Dickow, with the Organization for Associate Degree Nursing, and in my other hat, Health Impact, which is California's Nursing Workforce Center, and I just want to piggyback on a couple of comments, and we actually in California um, are going forth with a pilot study with four schools, two community colleges, and two state universities on looking at completely changing the clinical rotation experiences for our students. And we didn't make this up. We actually stole it very shamelessly from Thomas Jefferson University, where a fantastic program occurred in a bachelor's um, nursing education track that was completely community-based, no acute care settings. Those students passed the NCLEX at 98.5% the entire cohort. So um, I just encourage us to continue to look. And actually, our pilot, Lynette, came from um, the practice side saying, we, this is Kaiser Permanente, our largest provider in California, um, we see that our nurses need to be way out here now. If we're really following the trends for our members, it has to look like this. And so um, they are helping to fund this project 
um, in four schools to change the curriculum to get the nurses they need to practice. And now Stanford um, Medical Center has joined that project as well, seeing the same thing. So I think our providers are seeing where their members need to be cared for, and, and I hope to see that helps change the focus of our clinical rotations. I think Kaiser is a great model to look for workforce innovation as well. They've certainly been a, a front runner there. How about we'll go here and then we'll go back. Um, so a hand. Kanita Carter Hurset. So my question is in reference to retooling the existing workforce. So coming from a different direction, but with education and training in mind. So what are some of the greatest opportunities as well as challenges in retooling the existing workforce? And how might that be used to leverage training and education um, on the education side of the equation? Thank you. Thanks, Kanita, for that question, because I have a whole other slide deck on, on retooling. <laughs> yeah, I'll just pull it out. Um, so let me start with the challenges because I always like to end on a, on a bright note. So one of the biggest challenges we see for retooling the existing workforce is that, frankly, time spent training is not time spent billing. And we talk a lot about being in a value-based environment, but let's be honest, most of our health systems are still predominantly fee-for-service. So that's one of the key barriers that we hear from people is I can't really take my MA out or I, medical assistant, I can't take my nurse out be, because of, of, of lost billing um, that happens with seeing that patient. Um, another challenge is that... Quite honestly, we don't have education systems and others are struggling to educate the pipeline and, and meet those demands, trying to develop the modular curriculum needed, for example, around care coordination or patient engage engagement or motivational interviewing or, or learning to use EPIC for risk stratification. So I guess I, I and you all are the experts here, I, I am very humble as a, as a health workforce researcher. I just see the data. But what, what could potentially, I think, happen is a modularization of courses so that we can actually deliver these modules to people who are actually currently based in, in using technology um, in there. I, I think ECHO, the ECHO model, is a fantastic model, for those of you who don't know it, um, which started as a way to, to meet uh, patients with hep C, but now has become a training model, which is absolutely um, critical. So I think that there are bright spots out there and good opportunities, but to me this is the predominant challenge, and, I, and, I, and our legislators in, in North Carolina like to focus on shiny new graduates, and I say that's great, but you've got all these workers who really have got to retool, and I really worry about nursing, frankly. Nursing is the group that keeps me up at night, because I worry about nursing shifting from, out, from inpatient to outpatient, and, and, and I had a conversation with a CEO out, out in one of our Western hospitals who was really worried that his nurses wouldn't be able to retool, that there wouldn't be the opportunities to be able to do that. That becomes about your livelihood and that becomes about, uh, about your income. And so this is imperative, and I, I don't, we can have a separate conversation about that, but yeah. I'll, I'll add to that that a strategy um, that I think can help is create the motivation for the existing workforce to retool. Right? We could have conversations about, oh, we're going to bring you into a cultural competency class or we're going to, you know, whatever. But without feeling the reason that they're actually doing it, it's very hard to create that motivation. So we're just finishing up this very interesting evaluation with LA County, um, which is you know one of the largest health systems in the US. And it was a grant from HRSA, Interprofessional Collaborative Practice Grant, that was brought in because they, decide, they had decided to go into a patient-centered medical home model within their ambulatory care clinics. With that model, um, the director of the whole health system, Mitch Katz, who's now in New York, darn it, we lost him, uh, said, you know, we have a workforce, right? We have who we have. We are a county agency. We can't lay people off if we don't like them very easily. So we have who we have, and we have a cadre of, say, nurses who predominantly have spent the past however many years with their job being to take vitals and put the patient in the room for the doctor, it was not a patient-centered medical home, and the nursing skills were being vastly underutilized. So, ha and from the acute side, you know, this LA County USC Medical Center. So that in that medical center, that the tertiary stuff is the sexy stuff, right? The good nurses go do that, and then the ones who kind of want to be lazy go to the ambulatory care. Was kind of the reputation. So you have what you have. You want to do a patient-centered medical home. You have to lift up the nurses to take on those roles. 
and have them not feel put out and feel excited about doing this. So this grant enabled them to bring in some expertise to really talk about professionalism, talk about the, you know, the nursing role, talk about, and then put, bring in the, the um, specific skills. Let's talk about trauma-informed care. Let's talk about social determinants. Let's talk about how to be a really good care manager and navigator and find the social workers. And the nurses gradually, actually fairly quickly, came on board. But there was a motivation there was a shared mission. There was a system where the incentives aligned with that. And then they started bringing in students from the Cal State campus who then were getting exposure in ambulatory care. And for the people in the system, they said, oh my gosh, I love these leadership students. They're like making me think about what I do. They're making me think ahead. Um, you know, so it, it's been this kind of four-year process where halfway through we're going, what, are, what is this grant doing? Is this going to show anything? And now at the end with our final interviews done, I'm, I'm just so excited about what they've accomplished. But they had to have that mission of transformation to motivate everybody to get on board with redeveloping their skills. And without that transformational goal, I don't think it would have gone anywhere. Let me go one question here and then we'll come over to table four. Yeah, actually, your answer right now kind of confirms some of the things I was going to say. I, I think our, our students are ready to get agitated. They, they are absolutely ready. And I think we will, we will get even better and brighter students if we create a more dynamic yeah. health care system. I think some of them, we lose good ones they, you know, because they, they, see, they, they see the same old thing. And they, if they... If they see a, a, a bigger and a, 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 a wider thinking that's really addressing societal needs, I think students who we thought wouldn't even go into health care will be attracted to health care. You know, maybe that student that wants to get their MBA, they read, now they're thinking about becoming a, you know, a, a nurse practitioner or something like that. I mean, I think, I think there's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a system that will feed off itself, and I think that... I think the students will, will energize the care providers, too. I think if you create that environment where they're excited, um, I, think, I think that'll help transform the system. You may think it's only a little at a time, but that can be a, that can be a tremendous motivation for change, even of the existing care providers. Let me come to table four here too. Let me just add sort of one comment as you think about it. From, from the health system, healthcare delivery side, I think one, one other comment that sort of is confusing when you're trying to be a good academic partner is when the different professions have such unique requirements and the vocabulary around those needs is so difficult. I think if, as an education community, if we can sort of integrate and align, it'll just be easier. Complex asks are always hard to deliver. Um, so maybe we can also think a little bit about how so much of what I've heard around shared values, patient and community centered care, and trustment, and these types of concepts, we can sort of normalize and create some uh, cohesive language. If there was a question from table four, and then we'll come to six, and then our time will be pretty much up. We, we started a little early, so I, we can either, is that all right? Yeah. So we'll go here. Thank you so much for the great presentations, Maria Tassoni from the University of Toronto and the University Health Network in Toronto. Um, so I'm just wanting to bridge a previous workshop on technology and what we've been talking about this morning and wonder your thoughts in terms of just thinking that's either in place or to come <laughs> around the emergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning in health workforce planning. So when I think about examples like planning time being cut in radiation therapy or in radiation medicine, um, the emergence of smart homes for seniors, some of the predictive impacts to the imaging related professions, how are we thinking about some of those things and might a value for our students be around their technological savvy and what they're actually bringing into the workplace? We're going to have Siri or Alexa respond to your question. 
The answer is, I can only speak from the provider side that technology is being used uh, in our aging services, definitely um, smart homes for individuals uh, in our home and community-based programs to stay in their home and not be institutionalized has been around for quite a while. Um, looking at tele-rehab and uh, being able to, especially outside of North America and places where there are rural areas uh, in Sweden, Norway, they have used tele-rehab for a very long period of time. Uh, many apps are being developed in a variety of different settings to be able to uh, provide cognitive rehab training. So if those things aren't being taught in the school, that those are tools that are being implemented and used widely, then that would be a gap. And I just want to thank you for the question because actually about three weeks ago I said to Barbara, you know, I need to really think more about how technology is going to impact the health workforce. And so I've been trying to do that, but probably not to the degree that y you would suffice for a good answer. Um, but it is an area where we sort of have to think about the issues around the degree to which technology will substitute versus supplement versus enhance. I mean, so I, I think I would sort of have a conceptual framework in my mind that works that way. So it could, in fact, substitute in a place where we're doing home monitoring so that someone doesn't have to come in to take your blood pressure or do your weight and have it report back, right? It could supplement in terms of communication between the home and the medical practice or the, or the hospital, right? It, and, and it could enhance, in fact, other services. And, and so that's one of the things that I'm trying to, in my own mind, get a conceptual, but you are the expert here and probably have much better sense uh, there in the snowy north about what we should be doing. I'll quickly add that tech developers in these areas often do not think about the health workforce. We're finishing up a project now through our um, HRSA-funded Workforce Center on Emerging Technologies and Long-Term Care and what the workforce implications are. And um, you know, okay, my husband's an engineer, so I can say it. There are a lot of dude bro engineers who have never talked to an old person but think it's going to be so cool to put monitors on all of them. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, it's just, it's really incredible what a gap there is between some of the tech that's in development and actually thinking carefully about who is going to use it, who is going to touch it, how is that going to affect practice, how is that going to affect education that's required. So that could be a whole other workshop. But if you want a good laugh, go to the Aging 2.0 conference sometime. Sorry, I just want to add one comment. I've actually been doing some work in New Zealand. Um, and one of the things that New Zealand is trying very hard to do is design the technology around the patient, not the healthcare provider. And I think that's really important is because when you design technology around the patient's needs for services, what emerges is a very different sort of technology than when you try to figure out the way that the current existing health workforce could be retrofitted with technology. So want to add that as a really important point for us to be thinking about over the next course of the day, you know, two days around sort of what does the patient really need and how could that technology um, enhance their lives? The only thing I want to add is I hope that all of you in this room are aware of Eric Dishman. And Eric is someone who now is at NIH. He was with Intel. And he does send some incredible work and is very person-centered with his technology. So if you're not aware of him, he's someone who definitely I think is an interesting source. I'm going to suggest to Barbara that next year, since Amazon HQ2 is coming, we have one of their informaticians <laughs> or data modelers here. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, there was a, here, back at um, maybe seven? Yeah, yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Ron Severo from the Uniform Services University, and I really want to pick up on the idea of retooling the workforce. Um, last April, we had a workshop on exploring the business case for high-value CPD, so I think this fits into that. Um, I guess a couple of really critical questions would be retooling for what? Who decides? Who's going to create the curriculum? Who owns the curriculum? These are really critical questions, which we have answered very rigorously at the pre-service level. We have all kinds of regulation, but once we get out into practice, we count hours of participation. So I think if we're going to retool, which I, I totally agree with, how, how do we think about these questions? Thank you.
<laughs> you know, I, I, th I think the key thing is, is actually that motivation of what are you retooling for? And the data can help inform it, and Aaron will help agitate about it, and I'll, you know, point out all the numbers. But um, what you're re retooling for and um, having leaders who are willing to really take that on and move it forward are, you know, in the end, our data will just aid and abet them, but it doesn't replace that leadership and that, that motivation of where we're going. So I think one of the key audiences in this retooling conversation are employers and health systems, because one of the things that we see, some really nice work done by a colleague, Lucine Pagoyson, um, has really been looking at the, the major decisions around staffing are made by the employers, and, and they make... Um, assumptions around what different healthcare professionals can do. But those assumptions in the paradigm of, of, of financial shifts are changing, and they're wanting to sort of rearrange things, and one of the barriers is the fact that they're going to have to retool, um, and they know that. So I think engaging health systems and employers in this conversation is absolutely critical. But frankly, and I'm about to make you uncomfortable, is, gauging, is, is really engaging the health professions themselves in terms of having conversations around the fact that if I retool the MA to do that, the medical assistant to do that, family doc, you might not need to do that. Or nurse, that's actually what the social worker is doing. And here you get into some very thorny, but for me intellectually interesting questions around what retooling means when you take the existing workforce and think about how to redeploy them and retool them for optimization. And so I think we have our work cut out for us, but two key partners being health systems, hospitals, and professions and professional associations in those conversations. Uh, the only group you didn't put in there is a payer. Yeah. And they need to be at the table. You can't do any of this without having all the people who represent the different ideas at the table. Because if you don't have the payers there, you can create a beautiful system and they'll say, mm, no. Sort of echoes that point again about this work will require humility by all involved and constantly pushing away the natural tendency for protectionism and sort of the, the silos that we've sort of built in. We probably have time for maybe one final question. Um, I've, no, he, yes, I've missed you twice, so let me correct well, that. Well, thank you. It's okay. Um, I'm Lisa Howley with the Association of American Medical Colleges, and just first of all, I want to say thank you for all of you, your expertise, uh, the great work that you've been doing around uh, around a workforce, and then of course preceptorships internationally. Um, and I just, I, I, you know, this has I've been thinking here about this value question, the question of value and understanding the needs of our healthcare systems, which I think is really critical. And I think it's on us as educators to demonstrate the positive impact that our education or educational interventions can have on. The things that our healthcare systems care about, the things we all care about, like readmission rates, like you know, can we and we have um, you know demonstrated that through education, for example, out at our skilled nursing facilities, we can reduce significantly reduce the readmission rates back into the health and into the acute care settings by training by some pretty you know. Uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, in-service training. Um, and there are other examples, whether it's students as navigators and the benefit that that can have um, on the outcomes that our health systems care about. So I think um, I'm interested in, in your thoughts about uh, educational research that looks at uh, the, the value of these types of, of interventions. <laughs> Or maybe it's just a plug for all of us to do more of that and call it call attention to the work that 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 yeah. um, we're doing or we could be doing more collaboratively together as interprofessionals. Did you want to respond, Barbara? No. Um, I, I think the work you're doing through yeah. the HRSA is really <laughs> exemplar for that. Um, actually, I'm quite proud of the collaboration that's going on now between the professions. So we are very close to having a IPE consensus guidance document with. Uh, 24 accreditation agencies have been working together. Um, there are bright spots all around this room for working together. Uh, and we've actually been working on an IPE core data set, which is actually in practice. So I think the more we know we, of each other's work and carry it forward, is there is just absolutely no question that needs to be done. So I don't know if that we could talk at coffee because the break is now. And uh, we have a 
first of all, I want to thank the panel. Uh, <laughs> there's no question you started us out great this morning. So, uh, and we are going to take a break till about 11.14 since we're a little early. Uh, and we'll reconvene. So thank you.